Later that year, they said they were selling 10,000 skateboards a day. They become the first brand ever to have a skateboard team. What's up guys? My name's Levi and I'm from Shred Shop, connecting you to skateboarding. And today we're gonna to do a brief history on skateboarding. Guys, stick around until the end where we share our favorite comment of the week. Maybe you can be our favorite comment of the week next week. In this video, we're gonna talk about skateboarding from the dawn of time until now. We're gonna talk about key events, things, names, whatever that needs to be mentioned. If there's major things that we have missed, let us know how we're idiots in the comments below. The sport of surfing traces all the way back to the early 1700s in some crazy faraway tribes in Hawaii. In 1819, a man named Mr. Petabled patents the first roller skates that we know of. The sport of roller skating slowly develops over the years and they start making roller skating gardens or arenas. In the early 1900s, surfing comes from Hawaii to Southern California. It explodes as a local pastime. In the 1920s, surfing contests explode in the Southern California area, and they start to make their way into mainstream culture. By the 1950s, surfing is blown up, and it's making its way into movies, TV shows, songs, magazines. In 1921, we see the first versions of this scooter skate. In the mid-1930s, the Chicago Roller Skate Company develops and patents an axle that pivots around a rubber pivot cup which is similar to the trucks that we know for skateboarding today. With the popularity of surfing growing, people are taking apart the roller skates and mounting them to the bottom of pieces of plywood to get around. It gives the same feeling as surfing and it's dubbed sidewalk surfing. In the hardcore surfers, they used it when there was no good waves. It's important to note that there's no tricks at this time. It is basically people just riding it around on flat ground. In 1956, there's a company called Humco they were the first company to manufacture and sell skateboards commercially. Three years later, another brand, Roller Derby, releases their version called the Sidewalk Surfer. This is the first early ad that we see about skateboarding. The first versions of these boards had steel wheels and they rotated directly on the axle with no bearings. Let's head into the 1960s. Skateboarding at this time is very held back by the equipment that they have. At the time, the extent of what people could do was nothing more than slalom or bombing hills a little bit going around schoolyards. Right after this, clay wheels kind of come on the scene and they take over the popularity of steel wheels, making it way more possible to do a lot of things on your skateboard. Clay wheels at the time weren't just made of clay. They were made of clay, paper, plastic, nutshells, and glue. In 1962, a retail store called Val Surf becomes the very first surf shop to carry and sell skateboards. In 1963, a brand starts called Makaha Skateboards. Later that year, they said they were selling 10,000 skateboards a day. They become the first brand ever to have a skateboard team. The first issue of Quarterly Skateboarder magazine comes out, and that's the first fully dedicated skateboard magazine. In the mid-1960s, Patty McGee is one of the early pro skaters. She becomes pro for hobby skateboards, and in 1965, she's on the cover of Skateboarder Magazine and Life Magazine. In 1966, the first van store opens up in Anaheim, California. In the late 1960s, Zephyr Skateboard Shop opens up in Santa Monica, California, which is, at the time, the hub of skateboarding. In 1969, the kicktail for the skateboard is invented. Skateboarding the sidewalk, surfing with me. Now let's head over to the 1970s. In the 1970s, skateboarding moves from schoolyards to pools. In 1972, Frank Nosworthy invents the very first urethane skateboard wheel. It's called the Cadillac Wheel Company, and the technology is stolen from roller skate wheels. The invention of the urethane wheel gives skateboarding a newfound popularity and a second life. With wheels switching from clay to urethane, People can ride them harder. They can ride on different surfaces. They don't have to worry about them breaking as much. So they're pushing them to their limits. And that's how skateboarding moves into the backyard pool. And we start to see the wall ride. In 1973, Zephyr starts making skateboards on their own. 
They're making them out of plastic. At the same time, Santa Cruz Skateboards is formed. At that time, there was around 2 million skateboarders in Southern California alone. In 1975, Santa Cruz invents their Road Rider wheels. They are the first wheel with the precision bearings inside of them. Again, with the products getting better, it pushes the tricks and the level of skating to a whole new level. This year, Tracker and Bennett hit the world market with trucks. And as well, 3M starts making grip tape. Around this time, Dogtown Skateboards is invented. As well, skate parks start popping up all over Southern California. In 1976, a young Canadian named Willie Winkle creates the very first ever maple skateboard deck. The same year, Tony Alva and Stacy Peralta team up with Vans to create the very first ever skater designed shoe and it comes out with the era. At the same time, there is droughts going all throughout California. So the pools are empty in everyone's backyard and it just makes skateboarding even that much more accessible. In 1977, George Powell starts the Powell Corporation. A year later, Stacy Peralta teams up with him and now we see Powell and Peralta. Then they start working on their own version of the urethane wheels, the Bones. This year we see Stacy Peralta signing to Vans, marking the very first ever pro skateboard shoe contract. Around this time, people were still kind of making boards out of a bunch of different crazy wacky materials. Things like aluminum, plastic, and fiberglass. As the skateboard materials were progressing, the skateboard tricks were getting better and better. Tony Elva does the first frontside air in a pool, and Alan Gelfand invents the Ollie. Skateboarding is so popular that Pepsi starts sponsoring skateboard tours all over the US. In the late 70s, Paul Peralta starts releasing some of their first pro models. They first released the Ray Rodriguez by an artist, VCJ. This year, Independent Trucks is founded by Fausto Vitello and Eric Swenson. They become so popular that they take over the truck world, gaining 50% of the market for trucks. This year, a young kid from Gainesville, Florida, named Rodney Mullen, wins his first ever skateboard contest. Not long after, Stacy Peralta retires from skateboarding and he starts the Bones Brigade. And then, the first ever skateboards to have concave are released. Let's check out the 1980s. Vert and bowl skating are exploding. Skateboard technology is progressing so much. There's this new thing called concave, allowing different shapes and different sizes and different feels to a board. In the 1980s, seven ply maple boards become the standard. As well, shape boards become super popular with every pro having their own personal shape as well as their graphics. At the beginning of the 80s, skateboarding is starting to decline in popularity again. Rodney Mullen wins the Oasis competition and he goes pro for Paul Peralta at age 13. In 1981, Thrasher Magazine is born and Rodney Mullen invents the flat ground ollie. This is what the basis of modern day street skating is formed upon. He invents the ollie, the kick flip, the heel flip, the 360 flip, impossible, backside flip, half cab flip, switch three flip, and so many more. He's also influencing the vert skaters at the time because they're taking his flat ground tricks and they're taking them into vert. In 1982, Paul Peralta releases their first ever Tony Hawk's pro model. Some other rookie pros that came out that year were guys like Gator, Christian Asoy, Lance Mountain. In 1983, the very first Trans World magazine comes out. In the mid 80s, street skating is becoming super popular as people are taking the freestyle tricks that Rodney Mullen invented and taking them to the streets and in the urban areas in the city centers. The Bones Brigade video show is released in 1984 and it changes the way that skateboarding is marketed forever. It dawns the era of skateboard videos. In the mid 80s, skateboarding has become popular again. As street skating is on its rise, Skateboarding seems more accessible. You can go out and do it more. You don't need a pool or a half pipe to go and do it. Vision releases the first Gons Pro model and SMA releases the very first Nautis Pro model. In 1986, the movie Thrashing comes out. This year, two new shoe companies also start, Airwalk and Etnies. The next year, Etnies releases the very first Pro model skate shoe with Nautis. Not long after that, Vans releases the Caballero which is the longest running pro model skate shoe, which then goes on to be the half cab, which is the longest running pro model skate shoe. In 1988, Steve Rocco forms World Industries with Blind being formed a year later. In 1989, World Industries comes out with the pro model Mike V Animal Farm Board. It's designed by Rodney Mullen with heavy influence from a freestyle skateboard. It's also known as the birth of the modern day skateboard. 
At this time, street skating is getting pushed to new limits by skateboarders like Gons, Natus, Mike V, Frankie Hill, Ray Barbie, and Tommy Guerrero. We're headed to the 1990s. Street skating is taking over. Basically, all the board shapes are pretty much a popsicle shape. They're all looking pretty similar because they found the right formula. And it is the big pants, small wheels phase. In 1991, Blind Video Days comes out and it basically pushes the progression of street skating to a whole new level. Throughout the 90s, a ton of skater owned board brands explode. Brands like Alien Workshop, Plan B, Real, Birdhouse, Girl, Antihero, Toy Machine, Zero, Shorties, and many more. In 1994, DC Shoes is formed and they start making technical skateboard footwear. At the end of the 1990s, skateboarding is becoming progressively more technical and dangerous. Also in the late 90s, World Industries sells for $20 million. We're moving forward the 2000s. Skateboarding explodes and it becomes so popular in the mainstream with things like X Games, Tony Hawk Pro Skater. The industry is changing and there's tons of money flowing in. The Tony Hawk Pro Skater game drops in 1999 and a new version comes out every single year until 2007. Over the course of the decade, new skateboard brands are popping up. Brands like Baker, Almost, Enjoy, and DGK. Some of the more corporate shoe brands decide to re-enter the skateboard world. Brands like Nike SB, Converse, Adidas. This is the era where skateboard videos were everything. Here's the list of some of the sickest, most influential skateboard videos of the 2000s. Girl Yeah Right, Baker 3, the DC video, America's This Is Skateboarding, Alien Workshop's Photosynthesis, RDS FSU, Flip Sorry, Zero Dying to Live, S Manic Maddie, Enjoy Bag of Suck, Almost Round 3, and so much more. In the mid 2000s, we see that the iconic Game Changer 411 video magazine is slowly dying. In 2005, 411 releases their very last issue of 411 VM. And in 2007, Steve Barra and Eric Cawson start uploading footage from their private skate park for a website called The Barrack. This was such a key, unique time in skateboarding and media because it really was a change between everyone making full videos and releasing them on DVD to people uploading stuff onto the internet and finding out that you can capture skateboarding and capture people's attention to websites and eventually to YouTube and all that kind of stuff on the internet. This was a unique point in time for skateboard media because it changed from people buying their skateboard videos to consuming their skateboard content and their pros on the internet. Where people went to the internet for their skateboard parts to follow up on their favorite pros. In 2008, P-Rod leaves Plan B to start primitive skateboards. We're moving forward to the 2010s. Instagram and social media have taken over the skateboard world. Basically, all skateboard media is consumed on the internet. In this decade, we lose Skateboarder Magazine, The Skateboard Mag, and Transworld Skateboarding, as print media is just harder and harder to make work. As we know, skateboard videos were going online. This was the tipping point for skateboard media because pros started to put out their video parts on Thrasher Magazine. The Barracks proved the need in the market for online skateboard video content, and Thrasher came in and they did street online video content. At this time, Thrasher becomes the main place for street skating online video content. They quickly move up to be the number one skateboard website in the world. In 2011, Polar Skateboards is started, proving that you don't need to live in California to be a pro or start a brand. Polar Skateboards was a catalyst in niche skateboard companies being started all over the world. In 2013, Dill and Ave left Alien Workshop to start FA Boards. This is followed by a slew of other niche skateboard brands popping up all over the world. Brands like Palace, Quasi, Weekend, Frog, Call Me 917, Alltimers, Dime, Passport, Sour, Isle, Magenta, Theories, Strangelove, Bronze 56K, GX1000, The Killing Floor, Quarter Snacks, Sci-Fi Fantasy, and probably a few more. So if you're young and watching this video, cuss us out below on your favorite brand that we forgot. We're headed into the 2020s. We are in the future. Got a question for you. Where will skateboarding go next? Even bigger pants, even smaller wheels? We don't know. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is Levi from Shred Shop, connecting you to skateboarding.
For this week's comment of the week, we have a spicy one from our friend Honey Thunder. He says, I'm 30 and still push Switch Mongo. When I was 13, I was at the SK8 park and had this kid relentlessly make fun of me for it. Next day, I showed up again with no SK8 board. I just beat that kid down. Bracket. He was a year older than me too. He spelled then wrong. Bracket. After that, no one ever made fun of me there ever again. And I still push Mongo now. L-O-L. Moral is, kids, if you want to be different, you better be tough. And you know what, Honey Thunder? You might be tough, but skateboarding still has proved you wrong. Pushing Mongo is whack as heck. Please, Honey Thunder, fall in line. You're ruining skateboard aesthetics for the rest of us. Now, everyone now thinks mall grabbing is chill because of the way that you pump. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Catch us for Comment of the Week. Hit the subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications so you can keep up to date on our weekly videos.